Um, I am uh, Jeff Hawkins, the director of the library. Uh, I'm also a 30-year veteran of the U.S. State Department, a former ambassador, and a former practitioner of foreign policy. Um, and I am particularly thrilled to have a conversation uh, with Professor Helen Milner, who is uh, a professor of, of foreign policy and, and of uh, international affairs and politics at Princeton University. Um, she is the director of the Niehaus Center for Globalization and Governance at the Woodrow Wilson School in Princeton. She is uh, a former uh, chair of the Department of Politics for, what, I guess about six years? Six years, yes. Um, <laughs> she has written extensively on issues related to international and comparative political economy. She has written on the connections between domestic politics and foreign policy, which I think is more, uh, a more interesting subject than ever these days, and the impact of globalization on domestic politics. Um, she is currently working on issues related to globalization and development, uh, and that includes foreign aid, the digital divide, global diffusion of the internet, resource curse, and the relationship between globalization and democracy in Africa and the Middle East. So I think uh, we've got the <laughs> makings of a really rich conversation, particularly because there's so much subject matter out there to deal with. Um, before we start, I just also want to um, thank Mike Duffy, who was sitting right there, who made this introduction and, and, and in part uh, uh, helped us make this evening possible. So um, I want to start, Helen, with a, a question about uh, the, the big picture question. And, and as we all know, tonight's the State of the Union address, so we're likely to hear from President Trump on uh, his views on uh, how things have gone over the last year, uh, including in the foreign policy realm. Um, given your experience and, and all the aspects of foreign policy you cover, uh, how do you think the president's doing in his first year? <laughs> <laughs> well, first let me say thank you very much for inviting me here tonight. It's a pleasure to get to talk to you all. and. Uh, it's a pleasure to get to interact with uh, you, Jeff, because uh, we do come from very different sort of uh, perspectives on, on uh, foreign policy, me more from the academic side and you more from the practical side. So I, I look forward to our, our conversation. Um, as, uh, in answer to your question, which is a difficult and long question, um, you know, I think many of us um, in the academic realm um, basically when Trump was campaigning, looked at everything he said and sort of said, oh my gosh, this is exactly opposite of pretty much everything we believe is in the American national interest in terms of foreign policy. And um, if he really does these things, we think it's going to be kind of a disaster for the United States. Um, and not just for the United States, but for the globe. Uh, uh, because what the United States does has a big impact on, on all sorts of uh, things that go on in the rest of the world. Um, and it was uh, from the top of the list down to the bottom of the list of things that he was talking about doing, we just thought were, um, the, the academic community thought were really the wrong things to do. Um, and I can sort of start out um, and talk about them. I mean, um, trade policy for interest. Uh, um, he made trade, I, I work on international trade a lot and trade agreements, and before the election, um, everybody told me like, Helen, nobody's interested in trade. Nobody knows anything about trade agreements. Who cares about NAFTA? The American public doesn't know any of these things. And um, after Trump, um, it's very hard to say that anymore because I think everybody now sort of knows about NAFTA or knows something about NAFTA. Does President Trump know about these things? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, that, was the, the, that was the thing that we were all sort of concerned about was that we just didn't think he understood, really. Um, any of the kind of uh, what was going on with trade agreements or with American trade policy at all. And that was, again, every single policy area, it was sort of like that. Um, and um, to come in and uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, he immediately, when he stepped into office, said, we're, we're getting out of it. You know, we'd been negotiating it. It hadn't been ratified or anything. Um, and many people said, oh, this is really a disaster because what you're doing is just opening the door to the Chinese and the Chinese influence, and you're leaving all of our allies and friends in Asia kind of without American sort of support and backing and, and, and credibility. And 
that's exactly the way countries are feeling now. Um, and, the, you know, China with this Belt and Road Initiative is taking the, the kind of, you know, initiative in the area and really pushing forward. And again, America is missing. And we're missing in action in a very important part of the world. And so, uh, uh, you know, trade is just one example. Foreign aid is another big area um, where they came in the first year. The Trump administration proposed something like 30 percent cuts to the foreign aid budget. The foreign aid budget is small. Um, the foreign aid budget in USAID is around $18 billion. With you add up a bunch of other things in military, and you get around $40 billion. The Defense Department budget is close to $700 billion. The president's request this year is $716 billion. $716 billion. So, so you know, $18 billion, $700 billion. $18 billion, $700 billion. I mean, these are, you know, and, and these are important sort of um, instruments of foreign policy. Foreign aid is an important instrument of foreign policy. Trade policy is an important instrument of foreign policy, just like the military, just like the State Department and diplomacy. And that's the other thing that I think everybody is really worried about Trump on is that he seems to think that the military and the use of force and threats are the only kind of instrument of foreign policy that's going to be useful. And we just know from lots of history and lots of other countries that that's just not the case, that there are many other instruments, trade policy, sanctions, foreign aid, um, diplomacy, <coughs> lots of things, propaganda even, all these things are very, very important in getting other states to do the things that you want them to do that they may not want to do. And he seems to be just solely focused on using the military instrument. Um, and we think that's going to be very costly and probably not very effective. Let's um, <clears throat> talk a, a little bit about the diplomacy aspect of this. Um, and it's something you and I talked about yesterday. Uh, Rex Tillerson was a seemingly uh, logical choice for, for someone like Trump um, a, as head of uh, uh, Exxon Mobil, somebody who has had a lot of experience in the international realm, including in, in, in difficult places. And in, 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 uh, I've certainly had plenty of experience with Exxon in some of the tough places I served in in Africa and elsewhere. Um, but it's a secretary who came in e either at the president's urging or not, I don't know, um, seemingly with a single-minded agenda to, to uh, reduce the, 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 the organization, the State Department, um, came in with a, 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 this request for a 30 percent budget cut, um, didn't fill a lot of positions, and that still continues to be true up until this day. Um, lost a lot of good talent. I'm part of that talent, and, and uh, I'm part of the great uh, Trump exodus of, of 2016-17. Um, what do you think's going on there, and, and what does that do to our ability to, to affect positive change overseas? Yeah. Um, it, it's very surprising that somebody gets appointed as you know a minister or the head of a department, and they don't defend it. It's just very, very surprising. Um, we have sort of all sorts of books written in political science about how these ministers, you know, are tenacious in their defense and the uh, pro, you know pushing forward their department and fighting for money and fighting for resources for the department. To not do that is like almost traitorous. <laughs> we certainly felt that way. <laughs> it's, just, uh, it, it's, just, it's just very, very strange. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, Trump came in with this, with, you know, the Bannon message of let's burn everything down. Um, and the place where that's stuck the worst is the State Department, I think. The other departments seem to be doing okay. Um, I mean, I not know great. If people in EPA or Interior, or whatever, would agree with that. But well, I would think state is doing worse. I mean, the the last figure I read was that two thirds of the top appointments in state have not been filled yet, um, and they're losing people like you uh, pretty much daily. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's very hard to run a department when you're when you're kind of doing that and when you don't have people in place. And you know, right now, I guess we don't have an ambassador in South Korea. I mean, it makes it very difficult to deal with the situation of North and South Korea, which is a pretty dicey situation that we would want to have, like, to be dealing with. Um, and so, you know, lacking these, these types of ambassadors and staffs uh, in these places is, is very difficult. And again, um, Tillerson has focused completely on reorganizing the department 
rather than a whole bunch of other things. And this internal reorganization has just, I think, sapped the energy of the department very strongly. And, um, you know, there's not providing any input into Trump and his, you know, supposed decision making, which again is kind of scary. Um, because these are pretty complicated issues and you need input and you need people who know the situation on the ground to tell you what's going on. I mean, I think again, the North Korea, South Korea thing, I think Trump's fiery talk uh, and nuclear war talk has, has had a, a, an unfortunate and unanticipated effect, which it's driven the South Koreans and the North Koreans closer together against the Americans. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, uh, Trump didn't expect that, and, and it's probably not a great thing to have that happening right now. There's always tension between the White House and the State Department and the State, Heart, State Department and DOD. That, that's baked in, I think, to the, to the policy-making process in Washington. Um, but what do you make of the President having his son-in-law do Middle East peace? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that doesn't seem to be going so well, right? I mean, uh, uh, they really, they stirred up, they, they allowed the Saudis to do a whole bunch of things with the, now with the isolating Qatar um, and basically stoking this Sunni Shia uh, sort of conflict in the Middle East. Um, the whole uh, recognition of Jerusalem and moving the embassy, um, these things are not sort of pushing things forward from what I can tell. Um, and I don't know what Kushner's doing these days. Um, <laughs> Keeping a low profile, I guess. Uh, may, maybe we'll hear more about that tonight. Uh, again, the, the State of the Union address may, may cover some of that. Um, you've worked a lot on the, the uh, interaction between domestic politics and, and foreign policy. I'd be interested in knowing what you think Trump's base's expectation of, of a Trump administration foreign policy are. What do they care about? And, and what foreign policy issues, if any, um, will impact on the election this year, the con you know the, the uh, congressional election in 2018, and in the presidential elections in 2020. I sort of think there were two or three things that his base was really looking for. I mean, one was on the trade side, um, which was sort of a trade and kind of immigration, which was like let's stop this and and let's you know not have more trade and more sort of factories closing and let's bring all coal back and let's bring all the factories back. Um, and so I think there's, there's kind of that side of things and uh, the immigration side of things of, of sort of holding those things down. Um, I think they also sort of want him to talk tough to all these other countries and they kind of like that, I guess. Um, and uh, I think the third thing, though, that may be a real problem for him is that he sort of talked about getting out of the wars and ending American involvement in wars, and that is not happening. Obama did that too. Yeah, um, but but I think I think Trump's people really wanted that, and many of them are probably military families. I think um, the military, um, the polling suggested that uh, the military was very heavily Trump uh, voters, um, and a lot of uh, families in areas where um, the kids are going to go into the military come from areas that look like they're probably Trump voting. Um, and the, the military is not being drawn down. I mean, I just read today the, in Afghanistan after Obama had this terrible time, right, drawing down the forces, Trump is now building them back up slowly but surely. Um, and they've gone from uh, 10,000 up to 14,000, and they're talking about doing more because they're having no effect whatsoever on the situation on the ground. Um, so I think that's going to get worse for him. Um, and I think his threats to Pakistan and trying to cut off aid to Pakistan, they're backfiring too because the Pakistanis, through their sort of many strange paths, um, have, I think incited the Taliban and, and ISIS to, to launch some of these attacks that we've seen recently um, in, in Kabul and things like that. So uh, I think that, again, he's, uh, uh, these policies are misfiring because they don't understand that other countries don't just, when you America says, don't do that, they just stop or something. Um, so. Well, I, I, uh, I served in Afghanistan 2003 to 2004. I can't say that the situation is noticeably better than it was when I was there. In, in many ways, I think it's a lot worse. Um, and even, even in those days, uh, it, it was my strong sense that that conflict 
was, was going to end in a way that was probably less than satisfactory for the United States um, and, and certainly involved negotiating with the Taliban and seeing them take some sort of role in, in, in government. That doesn't seem like a Trump sort of approach to a problem like this, but I don't think the military solutions have no, there was a, much to help. Yeah, there was an article today that basically they had all these generals making comments through the years since 2003, and every one of them said, oh, yeah, we're making progress. Things are getting better. And it was kind of like Vietnam all over yeah. again. <laughs> it was, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel, things are getting better. We got more body count. And it's like, but, you know, <laughs> nothing is working. <laughs> and the government now apparently in Afghanistan is in real trouble too. Yeah. I mean, they've never been that stable, but I guess they're doing even worse than, than usual. So, um, again, this is an area where military force is not going to solve the problem. You have to negotiate, and you probably have to use foreign aid, and maybe trade, and all sorts of other kind of, you know, diplomacy and, and things like that to get what you want and involve the Russians and the Chinese. But uh, again, as you say, that's not his path so far, at least. Yeah. We w when we talked, um, we spoke a little bit about the the military influence in the administration, and obviously the the president's chief of staff, his national security advisor. Um, other key figures uh, are, are military men, and they all, all are men. Um, his, the, the cabinet secretary that seems most successful and most able to resist kind of some of the more wacky political pressures in, in, in this White House, uh, you know, uh, Mad Dog Mattis, Marine General. Um, do you think that those, those men uh, play a, a, a positive role in this administration? They're often cast as the adults in the room and, and, and pushing the president to do the right thing? I, I sort of think they're very much trying to do the right thing. Um, I think the probably the sad thing about them is that, again, it gives a very military cast to everything we do because that's what they know best. And it's like many of us, you know, if you know how to do one thing best, it's the thing you're going to reach for in difficult times because you know how to do it best. And the problem is that, again, foreign policy instruments are many, and they're more than just the military. And to just always go to the military as the first solution, I think, is really, again, very costly and probably very ineffective. What, what else would, would a, a more well-rounded administration be looking at? Say, say, take Afghanistan as an example. I mean, you know, I don't have the, the solution to, to <laughs> Afghanistan, but again, I think you've got to be working with the Russians and the Chinese and the Pakistanis to, um, and probably the Iranians, frankly, to, to stop what's going on on the borderlands there in Pakistan, which is how they keep infiltrating in and, and you know, preserving themselves. And so that's probably going to take, um, you know, again, no negotiation and diplomacy of giving the Pakistanis some things that they want in exchange for them doing things that we want them to do. Um, and same with the Russians and the Chinese. I mean, you, you don't get sort of what you want for nothing in this world. And Trump seems to think that he's going to get what he wants for, for nothing. Uh, and I think he's got a <laughs> shock coming because the Russians and the Chinese don't give things away for nothing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> neither do the Pakistanis. And, and uh, also having served in Pakistan, you know, one of the things in dealing with these countries is you, you have to understand that they have their own national interests and their own, and, and you have to have a really keen understanding of that, hence the importance of experienced foreign policy professionals in the administration. Uh, and if, if you are, if you think that you're going to get a country like Pakistan to act against its interest in Afghanistan, what it perceives as its interest, um, that's just not going to happen. And we've tried a lot uh, over the years in various ways, and it just it, it doesn't work. Um, I wanted to, I, I know you've, you've done work on economic issues and sanctions and stuff like that. And speaking of Iran, um, the, the, the uh, lifting of the Iranian sanctions and, and the president's, the requirement that the president must certify on a regular basis and the very kind of ultimately ambiguous approach that Trump has had towards that, you know, denouncing it as a terrible, denouncing the, the nuclear deal with Iran as a terrible deal and we've got to get rid of it, but never quite getting to just, 
ending with it. What do you make of that? And, and um, do you think sanctions in that particular case are working? Uh, are they working other places? And, and how, do you, how do you tie those things together? So uh, my, my sense on the Iran situation is that now he said that he will, he's only, well, he did it one last time, he approved it one last time, and he's not going to do it again. But my sense is that European leaders have been very heavily pressuring him not to do this because they're not going to follow his lead, and so it's going to be the U.S. isolated again. Um, and I think, again, this is where Mattis um, and, and, and Kelly and things are probably coming in and saying, you know, uh, this was a pretty good deal. Um, it's not clear you're going to strike in any better deal. And if you just break, you know, if you just end it, we, you know, we're back to North Korea in some ways. Um, so I think that a lot of people have been pressuring him to again, you know, when he came, when he was campaigning, he just sort of said all these things. I think without really understanding the situation and really knowing things, because his crowd warmed up when he said, you know, Iran deal is terrible. We're going to get rid of it. And the crowd would go, yes. <laughs> and you know, he would then say, oh, we're really going to get rid of it. We're going to get rid of it tomorrow. And they go, yes. And you know, he thrives on that. Um, and so I think you know, he just sort of worked that all up. And in, in NAFTA, the same kind of thing went on. And uh, uh, you know, now he's in office, and I think he's seeing some of the issues with these things. That replacing these is not going to be easy. Um, and you know, I think that's the interesting thing is that um, he thinks that uh, Obama and previous presidents were bad negotiators, and the State Department did a bad job, and they didn't protect U.S. interests. But I think they all thought they were doing a very good job in protecting interests, protecting American interests, and getting the best job they could. And if you think that America was stronger, you know, 10 or 15 years ago than it is now, given how fast the Chinese have progressed, a deal now for the U.S. is probably going to look worse than a deal 10, 15 years ago. So it seems to me that he's kind of pushing against things and should be trying to sort of stabilize what we've got, rather than trying to push sort of extremely hard for something new, where he's likely to get less than we got before because we're less influential now, because people have the Chinese and other people they can turn to. Yeah, and it's, it's a complicated world. I, I remember when the, the Iranian uh, agreement was being negotiated, I talked to a couple of friends of mine who worked for the CIA uh, and covered that account in various ways. Um, and they, were, they had mixed feelings about it. I think there was a great deal of mistrust, not surprisingly, of the Iranians and what their intentions were. Um, and then also talking to American diplomats who were involved in that process. And it was a matter of getting the best deal we could, recognizing um, that it was less than perfect, that it was less than optimal, um, but telling ourselves that uh, a, having ten, year, 10 or more years of a non-nuclear Iran in a region as volatile as the Middle East um, was probably a better outcome than having uh, an Iran that that was being pushed into nuclear weapons, not only because it's an aggressive state trying to, you know, uh, establish hegemony, hegemony over the region or, um, you know, and supporting proxies and all the rest, but also because they may, in fact, have some legitimate, uh, you know, self-defense issues around that. It's a dangerous neighborhood that they live in. Um, and so the, a feeling that, like, this is, this is better than, than not. Um, and that doesn't seem to be the approach of this administration, kind of making those subtle calculuses about how we can inch the ball forward. It's, it's more couched in these terms of winning or losing. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't know what a win looks like, but I certainly know what a loss looks like in that situation. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that. <laughs> Um, how about uh, trade and, and globalization? Again, a, an area of expertise for you. You mentioned T TPP. You mentioned NAFTA. Um, President certainly extremely strident in his rhetoric about uh, our trade relations with other countries. Is this the end of a, of a global, you know, liberal trading regime? Or are we going to see a balkanization of things? And or or uh, are circumstances and perhaps he's even forces within his own party going to push Trump into something that ultimately looks more or less like what we have now? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to watch. Um, usually we expect the president to be sort of the free trader supreme and, and the one who wants foreign aid and all these things. And 
to, to watch Trump come in and, and not be that uh, is kind of a change of place. And so what you've seen is actually Congress, especially the Republicans, stepping up as being a force to save NAFTA, to maybe advance TPP and things like that. And they're being pushed very strongly by a lot of American businesses um, because it, you know, it turns out that NAFTA, uh, breaking up NAFTA is probably going to hurt Trump's base and Trump's areas of support much more um, than, than, than keeping it in some sense. Um, uh, agriculturally, uh, it's, very, it's been very good for American agriculture, which is the center of the United States pretty much, and that's Trump land. Um, and so uh, I think that he's getting a lot of pressure and pushback from American businesses um, as well as from Congress to, to, to sort of abrogate NAFTA. Um, and to rethink TPP, and he's also getting a lot of uh, pushback, I think, on TPP because other countries are just moving ahead. So the, uh, the 11 countries in uh, TPP have decided to move ahead with it without the United States. Um, Europe, the EU is now negotiating, they've negotiated an agreement with Canada, and they're ne trying to negotiate one with Mercosur, which is the big South American bloc. Um, and so you're seeing all these countries kind of signing these preferential agreements and leaving the United States out of the mix. And what that does is it just hurts American business. Um, and so I think that not only there's the economic side, where I think he's probably getting a lot of pressure on these things, and then there's the security side, where um, a lot of these countries, you know, their, their view of the United States comes in part through how it is, how is it as an economic partner. Um, and being a good, strong, credible economic partner um, it, it reassures them that the United States is not just neglecting them and forgetting them and, and going off and doing its own thing. And so I think, again, you know, with the Asian example, um, he's, uh, he's getting a lot of pressure to re-engage on TPP, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if he didn't find some way to do that. Hmm. That'd be interesting. Just a, a question on NAFTA. I'm, my operating assumption has already been, has always been that uh, the dislocations that were going to come from NAFTA have probably already largely occurred. Um, and, and now going back or abrogating that agreement and, and, and destroying that framework would, would be as dislocating or even more than the original process. Is that, would that be fair? Yeah, I think that's true. There, a lot of the adjustment has taken place since the agreement's, you know, many years old now. Um, and uh, again, to unravel these kind of complicated production chains that have been built up in these different areas uh, is going to be, would be very, very costly. Um, and uh, there was a, an article sort of looking at different sectors of the economy and how they're kind of implicated in all these cross-border flows between Canada and Mexico and the United States. And uh, uh, it, it would be, you know, again, you, you pay a lot of costs to, to redo these things. And the, one who, one, the people who are going to pay the costs are American consumers because tariffs and changing these things are going to simply make prices higher. And the companies are going to pass these on. They're not going to eat these costs. They're going to pass them on to American consumers, and you're going to see spikes in inflation, um, and you're going to see spikes in prices when, if you do this on a massive scale. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask one last question, and then we'll involve our audience a little bit in the, in the discussion. Um, and this is one I laid on you the other day, but it, it's a lot on my mind. Um, <clears throat> America uh, is unique, or, or nearly unique, in its, uh, the degree to which values often drive our foreign policy. Um, it's not just about naked self-interest with us. Sometimes it is, but, but not always. And there's often been an overarching kind of... Uh, theme to our foreign policy and anti-communism in the post-war period being the obvious one, but I can't tell you how many years I spent as an American diplomat annoying the hell out of other countries by criticizing their human rights uh, records because that was an important value for the United States and that we believed in human rights um, and we were willing to take hits in what would otherwise be considered our more narrowly defined self-interest to, to, to do that. What would you say the Trump administration's values are, and how are they applied in foreign <laughs> policy? I, they, sh they have shown zero interest in human rights and democracy promotion. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess I would say that I think those things are important, but again, um, when they started being the driver of things like the decision to invade Iraq 
in 2003, then I think they got kind of ahead of themselves. Um, because I don't think that uh, the war in Iraq promoted human rights or democracy, frankly, in the region um, at all. Well, we're not talking about implementation here. We're yeah. talking about uh, yeah. motivation. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I think Trump, you know, America first is what he just keeps saying. And, you know, America first, America's open for business. So it's, it's like we're a corporation. Um, and we're going to put our interests, you know, or as he defines them first, what, whatever those interests are, and we're going to be open for business. So if you want to come and, you know, buy our goods and you want to come and invest in our country, you know, you, you're welcome to. Um, but it's not really, there isn't, a, there isn't much of a vision beside that, that that seems to be out there. I mean, I think tonight in the State of the Union speech, you'll, you'll hear that. If you listen to the, his speech at Davos, which was one of the better speeches he gave, actually, um, it was pretty calm. He followed the teleprompter. Um, he didn't insult anybody. He didn't really run off key. But his, the whole message was America first, uh, which doesn't mean we're going to be isolated, but actually it does. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we're open for business, and I'm great, and I've done a great job, and we're winning now, and we're going to keep winning. Um, and I would imagine you're going to hear just a lot of that same thing tonight. Um, and it's, I don't know, I felt, as an American, I feel kind of cheap mm. when I hear that, right? It's like, ugh, he's our number one salesman. <laughs> you know, selling America, do we really need selling? Uh, I don't know, there's just something about that, that that really, you know, it doesn't it go without saying that we're a great country and a great place to invest and <coughs> Maybe the problem is now it does. <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, exercise probably worth worth doing for some of you that are interested in these things. Uh, on on a semi regular basis, the White House puts out something something called the National Security Strategy, um, and the Obama White House put out one in 2015, and, and in 2017 the Trump White House put out theirs. All you need to do is just take the table of contents of those two very otherwise very long documents and sort of lay them side by side, and you get a sense for for what's important and what the vision of the thing is. And, and um, the Obama document talked about security and terrorism and things that you would also find in, in, in the Trump document, but went on to talk about a whole lot of other things, and, and including values and including um, you know, humanitarian assistance and, and engagement in the world and reaching out to youth and, and things like that. And you take the, the, the same document put out by the Trump White House, um, and it's America first, protecting our borders, um, protecting our country from, from uh, negative immigration, uh, making sure that our military is strong. That's kind of the core of it. And, and again, the, the value part of that, I, I sometimes have a hard time seeing. Anyway, how about you all? Yes, sir. Well, to the extent that he listens to Mattis and oh, um, Kelly. And <laughs> Internationally, is anything going well? Uh, it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, you know, he, what is going well generally? So the stock market seems to be going well until the last few days. I don't know what that measures. He sees that as a measure of something. U.S. growth is okay. It's not as good as it was sort of doing. Um, you know, the dollar has been declining, so is that a good thing or a bad thing? But foreign policy is what my question is. That's good. I mean, you have the rest of it, I'll okay, But in terms of foreign policy, do you expect him to do anything right? <laughs> It's just hard to figure out what he's going to do that's going to be right. I mean, if you only have a military and that's the only thing you can use, that's got, that's it, that's what it's got. And, and you're not going to use anything else, and you're not going to talk to anybody else, and you and you know it's hard to understand how you're, he's going to negotiate with any other country. It's just it's unclear, you know, what happens. And you know he's treated our allies very badly, um, and. You know, allies are also a very important asset. I mean, they they help us in a lot of different ways. And he's, you know, again, running around with a, the, the can. Put your money in my can. I mean, it's embarrassing in some ways. I mean. <laughs> you 
Um, you know, Congress has abdicated on its uh, role in, in sort of uh, uh, allowing wars or not allowing wars to go on, and it's done that under lots of presidents now. And what if so, it reassorted its authority? <laughs> Um, I don't think he. Let, let's talk after November. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean, I, you know, I, I think on that point, there nobody's going to go anywhere. I think you know they're waiting for the investigation on Russia to see what happens with that. On on the North and South Korea point, the the what I wanted to say was, um, what you in a sense don't want to have happen is North Korea to take over South Korea. Um, or in sort of South Korea to become undemocratic and, and, and lose South Korea in that sense. And I think that the South Koreans are very afraid that Trump might start a war that destroys them, and so they become much more willing to do whatever the North wants. Um, and the North um, clearly wants to take over the South and not be taken over, and so then the question becomes, do the North and South negotiate some kind of a deal that pushes the United States out, which over the long run then somehow allows the North to, to take over the South? That's a long-term scenario, but it's never sort of been the case that the South Koreans were so afraid, I think, of the United States doing something crazy that they were just willing to kind of do whatever it took to get the, the North kind of on their side. So I think, I think there's a concern there that, that in a sense, saying kind of very warlike things on the part of the United States president makes the, the South Koreans very, very nervous and much more willing to accommodate the North, which is not something we're, we're all that interested in. And ironically, our, our goals, as far as North Korea are concerned, are, are a little um, counterproductive in some ways. And as I was leaving Central Africa, I was making the rounds of the other ambassadors to say goodbye, and I went to see the Chinese ambassador. and, and, and um, Chinese diplomats, generally speaking, are very unforthcoming. Um, they're very, very polite. They'll serve you tea, and they won't talk about anything substantive. So I'm thinking, okay, what do we talk about? Let's talk about North Korea. Uh, and and I, the, um, I said, you know, how do you think we're doing? How do you think the president's doing? What could we do better? Because China obviously has a huge role in all this. Um, and he, he brought up a point that I guess I've heard a few times since, but to me was new and, and very revealing. He said, the one case that, that Kim Jong-un is looking at very carefully is Gaddafi. Um, and uh, he, when Gaddafi had, was, was, was quote unquote nuts and had, was working on weapons of mass destruction, uh, everybody stayed out of his hair. It was the second that he started talking to us that he gave up the, 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 the weapons programs um, that the uh, F-16 started, you know, <laughs> bombing things. And he said, uh, you know, Kim Jong-un has, has learned his lesson from that. So the more um, bellicose that we tend to be, it, it doesn't have the, the effect of, of scaring him as much. It has the effect of driving him further into his own bellicosity, which is unfortunate. And Koreans are sitting there on that border saying, oh, and South Koreans, like, oh, my God, what's going to happen to us if this happens? Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you put your... Sure. You're talking more on the international front than on the yeah, domestic the front, yeah. Because I worry about democracy in America okay. and the institutions yeah. and things like that, and more Russian meddling, you know, yeah. has could have serious problems there. On the international front, I, I guess I worry a lot about our allies. Um, I think that uh, the Europeans are especially worried about what he's doing and whether he can be trusted and whether that then gives the Russians kind of more leeway to do nasty things uh, uh, along the eastern border of Europe and, and in Europe itself. Um, and so I worry that, um, you know, saying nasty things to the Chinese or the Russians uh, they're kind of used to that. A lot of presidents have sort of, you know, in, in nicer terms probably said pretty tough things to them. But saying sort of nasty things to the Germans and the French and the British, I mean, that really just undermines us. Um, and, and I wonder if then you can regain that trust, right? Sort of like having a great friend and all of a sudden they tell you, you know, they sort of have a bad day and they say something nasty to you. You know, you're kind of on guard with them after that, for, at least for a while. And so I worry about sort of destroying the, the kind of, you know, the, the Atlantic alliance that we've had that's been a, a, a force, I think, for good and, and for American, you know, national interest. 
um, uh, for you know 50, 60 years. And so I think that is a, a, an area to, to watch out on because if the Europeans just decide to sort of go their own direct way and, and you know, don't work with the Americans anymore, I, I think that would be a serious loss in many domains. Yeah, I mean, I, I, Jeff may know more about this than I do. My sense is that Macron has been trying his hardest to be, be friends with Trump and to reason with him and be friendly with him and to kind of, you know, sort of like, we're all guys together here. Um, I'm not sure how well that's working. Um, my sense is that he's, uh, Trump has really annoyed both Merkel and May. Um, and that for a variety of reasons, neither of them, probably in part because they're women, and I don't think he treats them quite as well as he treats uh, the men. I think both of them are just fed up with him. And, and I think, again, that's really too bad because these are our important allies. Uh, and many of the kind of wounds that he's inflicted are going to take a while to heal and, and mend over if, if they ever do. So uh, I do worry a lot about those relationships. Yeah. I, I mean, I... I have no idea whether this was done explicitly, but you kind of get the sense that Macron is, is the designated Trump whis whisperer for the for the Europeans, right? Um, and, and, and Merkel tried, and that was a disaster, so she's out of that game. Uh, and May tried, and then you know Trump goes and retweets racist stuff from the UK, and and so that's not working out. And, and um, I give Macron a lot of credit for for uh, for trying. Uh, and for focusing on that, uh, you know, Macron, I'm, I'm just reading the Plowright biography of, of his that we're going to talk about next week. Um, and uh, at least based on that, Macron is somebody that is uh, supremely self-confident. So I think he thinks, uh, probably thinks he has a, a good chance of charming Trump. And I guess on uh, Bastille Day last year that worked um, and, and Macron has an invitation for a state visit to Washington so we'll, we'll see how that goes um, but there, there's there are so many interests that we share uh, that that Trump somehow seems to question and there's so many common challenges and most notably climate change where France was a, was a real leader where we just there's no there's no common ground at all anymore I think Macron, whatever his talents and however charming he is, I think he's going to find that relationship difficult to sustain over the long term. Well, th this is the curious thing about Brexit because um, May and others in the Conservative Party have said, we are for free trade. We remain for free trade. We're going to do all these trade agreements, and we're going to be even more liberal after Brexit than, than during Brexit. And in part, our problem with Brexit is that the Commission has all these rules and regulations, and they're hemming us in, and they're taking our sovereignty away, and yada, yada, yada. And so it's not as if Brexit, um, Brexit is different from, from Trump's uh, words, in a sense, because the, the leaders of the Conservative Party in Britain are talking free trade all the time. Whether they're going to have that occur or not is, 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 is a different question. My, my sense is that a lot of the opposition to the EU in uh, Britain was over perceived uh, overstepping of regulation by the EU, which the Conservative papers you know, made sound like a horrible thing, and over immigration. Um, and some of it is trade, uh, uh, but I think a lot less. Um, and we know, you know, trade has, trade has different effects on different groups. Some groups gain from trade, some groups lose from trade. And overall, we think the nation gains and that you can, you know, if you have a good government, you can reallocate some of the gains and make up for those losses. Um, the U.S. and the U.K. have not been doing that because they don't have very strong social safety nets and things like that. Um, and I think both of those countries are suffering um, because of that, uh, where they just leave people who've been hurt by uh, globalization or trade. Um, and most of the, the problems that people are facing is, is technological change. Um, it's not mainly trade. Um, from what most of the economists tell you, most of the displacement you're seeing is, uh, again, it's automation, um, artificial intelligence, and increasingly it's going to be robots. So the problem that working class people have and that most of us are, may have, uh, or our kids, 
is, and their kids, is the, the question about jobs in the future. Um, and so that problem is not going away. And even if you close your borders, unless you want to, you know, sort of stop your economy in, in 2015 or something, you're going to be subjected to the winds of technological change. Um, and so governments are going to have to deal with this, uh, even if they do try and close these borders. So um, I, I read the Brexit situation a little bit, I think, differently than, than perhaps you do. I'm not an expert on uh, this area of the Middle East at all, so um, I would s certainly say, um, you know, those are very interesting questions. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think Trump did what he did in part because of domestic politics in the United States, and again, I think his, he saw this like the canceling of TPP, um, like the, the talking about NAFTA as an easy way to generate support uh, for his base. It's something that they really wanted. Um, and I, I, I think, though, that it's going to have the effect of just um, really making any kind of solution there very difficult. Uh, I, I don't see how it's, it's helping anything. Um, I think uh, it, it really sort of poses a problem for the Palestinians to come to an agreement at all. And I think it's probably going to push Israeli politics more to the right. Um, and so. Uh, I think that's separating the groups even more than they were separated. I don't know if this is an area you have a lot of. I, I have zero expertise in this, but that doesn't mean I don't have an opinion. Um, <laughs> and, and my opinion is, is largely um, like yours. I would say, for me, the fact that the Trump administration unilaterally decided to move the, the embassy to, to Jerusalem suggests that they're playing to the base. Um, Trump is the, the master of the art of the deal. I don't know many deals where you give up an extremely important bargaining chip before you even b begin the negotiation, unless there's some other interest driving it. Um, I would say one thing, I, and I'm not sure this is by design, but uh, give them credit, whatever. One thing that, that's, that's changed for, for the Trump administration is um, a lot of the, the Arab states that would be the most aggressive in, in, in defending Palestinian rights, I think they're a lot more worried about the, the Iranians and the Israelis these days. Um, and, and willing to, whatever the rhetoric is, kind of ignore that. Um, and so that perhaps that's playing a bit in the Trump administration's favor. Um, I would also say that I read somewhere, interestingly, that a lot of Palestinians are giving up on a two-state solution <laughs> and are look, thinking instead about a one-state solution um, because if you had a one-state solution that included the West Bank and Gaza and made uh, the people living there citizen, full citizens of Israel, there would no longer be a Jewish state. It would, it would be, uh, for all intents and purposes, an Arab majority state. And that would certainly change things significantly. So uh, who knows? <laughs> China's foreign policy. Um, again, I'm not an expert on Chinese foreign policy. Um, my sense is one of the big initiatives is this Belt and Road uh, uh, project that the administration has launched. Um, and again, um, I think it's an interesting and clever kind of uh, strategy where they want to make China's reach across the Eurasian continent into Europe through all sorts of different means um, and connect China much more to, you know, Russia and Eastern Europe and, 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 and Europe. Um, and I think um, they're again doing it in a way that is uh, what I would say using positive inducements, things that Trump doesn't seem to understand. They're giving people loans, they're use, giving foreign aid, they're building things. Um, and doing things for other, uh, other groups and other people. Um, and they're trying to bring uh, other countries in. They're trying to allow them to get some of the goodies from all of this. Um, they're, they're trying to sort of build alliances and friendship. Um, all the things that the United States used to do and should be doing, but is not doing. Um, and so I think that that is uh, you know, one thing that the Chinese are doing. And they're very happy that TPP is not happening. Um, because I think they saw that as a very clever strategy that sort of boxed them in um, with a, a America sort of much more solidified with allies in Asia around, around China. So I think they're happy that's not happening, and I think they're trying to pick off each one of the countries individually 
uh, uh, that, that were in TPP and that are around them, again, through using positive inducements. More trade with China, uh, you know, more projects from China, more loans from China, all the kind of positive things that help you build friendships and trust, uh, rather than nastiness through threats and, and military action. So I think, you know, that is uh, sort of part of their plan of expanding their influence and securing what they see as their interests. Not a China expert either, but but I, I'd say that um, one thing that, that that's going on is is uh, the president himself is is very kind of kind of a one trick pony, right? So during the campaign, there was a lot of talk about China and, and currency manipulation and 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 you know they're taking they're eating our lunch. We got to start winning again, kind of thing, uh, and that's why in part why we pulled out of the TPP thing. I think is just because. I mean, I guess well, he thought China was in TPP, yeah. uh, <laughs> which and, it's not. And then all of a sudden, he woke up and decided that North Korea was important to, to him. And, and uh, some people uh, probably told him that there wasn't going to be progress on North Korea without Chinese involvement. And then all of that sort of magically disappeared. And we certainly, I'm sure there are lots of people in PACOM and in, in the Pacific Command headquarters in, in Hawaii that are real concerned about what the Chinese are doing in the South China Sea and the Spratleys and all that stuff. Um, but I don't think the president is thinking about that at all because he's just focused on this North Korea thing and, and, and understands that the Chinese uh, are essential to solving that problem. I, um, I would say, <clears throat> I don't have an exact answer for you, but um, as I was looking at these things, another thing I looked at was the Republican Party platform. So the platform that was adopted uh, during the campaign and like most party platforms, including the Democratic Party platform, it was focused on domestic policy issues. It was talking about immigration and, and health care and, you know, repeal and replace and that kind of stuff. Um, and foreign policy comes way down on the list on those things. The rhetoric in the, in, in the Trump campaign was, was very protectionist and, you know, critical of, of this, uh, this or that country. But I don't think that was really primary focus of, of, of the, the, the administration. So the strategy document, the national security strategy, only focuses on foreign policy. Um, and so that's all about foreign policy. The, the wider platform of the party or, or the Trump's issues, I wouldn't say it's inconsequential, but probably second tier, right? Yeah. Although I think, the again, um, the, the focus on terrorism and the war on terror, I think, that comes stands out pretty strongly in, in sort of everything he's focused on, um, and uh, you know again whether that should be the focus of American foreign policy uh, is a real question. I think um, you know the statistics show that uh, what is it in the United States deaths by uh, Americans being killed by guns by other <coughs> Americans outnumber terrorist deaths uh, 20, 30, 40 to one or something. So okay, I think it's more than that. I mean, it's, it's, it's big, um, and, and the question really is, is this war on terror worth, uh, worth the kind of energy and intensity that, that Trump has sort of seemed to focus? And again, I think that was driven a lot by the domestic base, because you can really scare Americans by talking about, there is terror in the neighborhood, they're trying to get you, it's coming any day, you know, it'll be here, and I'm going to save you from it. Um, and again, this is this kind of uh, language and uh, sort of approach that I think Trump used very cleverly to push his, you know, his agenda and his votes. I mean, again, I think he, when he started out talking about TPP, he thought China was in it. And um, I think over time, it, somebody told him China wasn't in it, and I think it took him a while to believe that. <laughs> but I think it was easy. The agreement hadn't been ratified yet, so it was easy for him to, to do this as a very symbolic thing. And I think he did it like the first day, 24 yeah, hours in office. Um, and, and, I, and again, I think it was just an easy symbolic thing to do, to throw red meat to, to the base. And I, I also think that he thought he could just go in, it'd be easy, he'd go in and negotiate like he and, and Jared would just, you know, sit down with the, the, the Vietnamese and they'd negotiate a deal tomorrow and then they'd negotiate one with the, each of the 11 countries and, and that would be it. And, you know, the problem is <laughs> that's not working. Um, so, so, I mean, that's, 
Um, I, I don't know much about the Latin America situation. My, my sense is um, that they've neglected them. Um, my sense is, again, a lot of the State Department is not staffed down in, in South America. Um, and they've t tried to turn back the clock on Cuba. Um, and, you know, they've been working on Venezuela, I think, more probably than anything else uh, down there. But again, that kind of conflicts with uh, they don't care about democracy and, and all of that sort of stuff. And so they're sort of, you know, I think they think something should be done, but they can't figure out kind of like on what grounds and what should be done. <laughs> I mean, you know, he sends these tweets out and unfortunately, you know, everybody sees them and so even if you can say it's ridiculous and we don't care about it and he shouldn't be doing it, I think when he does send out these incendiary things, it does have an effect. Look, uh, I mean, President Obama tweeted, you know, uh, I think it's also you know, who, who you have behind the wheel, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, unfortunately, inequality has been increasing in all the rich, advanced industrial countries over the last 30 years. It's been especially bad um, in increasing terms in the U.S. and the U.K. Um, and part of that is um, we don't have the kind of stabilizers and social welfare uh, and social protection programs that a lot of the European countries have. And so in the face of not just trade, but in the face of technological change and um, a, a kind of a, an economy that doesn't reward low-skilled people very well, um, you've seen, and rewards uh, well, I shouldn't say high-skilled people because it's not clear all the finance people are super high-skilled, but um, that rewards a certain group very, very well. Um, uh, you've seen this increasing polarization uh, in, in all of these countries. Um, and this is one of, I mean, in the long run, people worry about this affecting the quality of democracy uh, because if, um, if, if a small group of people control a lot, a lot of resources, economic resources, and they can buy and uh, sell whatever they want in the political market as well, that's, that's not a good thing and it really erodes confidence in democracy. Um, people also, also think that it might have helped um, kind of Trump because you do have these aggrieved people and again, what is their, uh, what are they aggrieved about? Is it trade uh, per se? Is it that they lost their job to automation? Is it that, um, uh, you know, uh, they can't get out of the mortgage that they're in and their house is not worth much of anything anymore these days because of the community they were in and things like this. So, um, again, um, people have, uh, I think rightly so, have a lot of kind of concerns about things. Um, and the United States and, and, and again, I think even the UK should be doing more to help people uh, who are in these situations, which is a lot of the working class. Um, that haven't had real pay raises in 20 or 30 years. Um, and uh, what does it take to do that? Um, there are all sorts of different things from subsidizing education, uh, subsidizing uh, work you know, retraining and, and things like that that we just don't do in the United States that a lot of other countries have done uh, much better. And France, for instance, has faced some of the same forces we have, but they've done much better at uh, reigning in inequality. Uh, in part through a variety of things that uh, uh, Macron, unfortunately, is, is kind of tampering with. Um, uh, and we'll see, you know, what happens with that. Um, so uh, I think it's a, it's a it, you know, these are difficult <coughs> issues and they're, they're broader than just the globalization issue, as I said. Uh, and countries are going to have to face them. No, no, Trump is, I mean, again, American foreign policy was very much for many, many years about building up multilateral institutions from, you know, the OECD, the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO, uh, you know, the UN, obviously, um, and, and building these institutions up uh, and bringing in lots of countries so that we could have our allies and we could build friendships and allies and, and get everybody kind of moving in the same direction. Um, and Trump, again, I think, is wary of multilateralism. 
Uh, he thinks that America gets a rotten deal when we join these multilateral institutions. Uh, and he somehow thinks that if we do everything bilaterally, it's going to be easier and the U.S. will get a better deal. Um, the problem is that doing everything bilaterally is enormously time consuming and difficult and it's not at all clear you're going to get a better deal. Um, so I think you're going to see more of this because I do think they really distrust all these multilateral institutions which have been pushing it back against a lot of the things they're doing. So Yeah, and that, I mean, speaking as somebody that's worked a lot with the UN and other multilateral organizations and coming from a place that had a UN peacekeeping mission, um, there was a very clear sense in earlier days uh, that a lot of the really thorny problems that we as a superpower um, have to grapple with, it's easier to outsource it to the UN, even if it's inefficient, even if it's expensive, blah, blah, blah. That's a better solution than either letting things fester and then being drawn in or, or, or helping it ourselves. I, I meant to ask you, and I, I, I didn't get a chance to, um, Nikki Haley is one of the more interesting people in, in, in the foreign policy, yeah. the Trump foreign policy realm, and, and I think has negotiated that a little bit more successfully than, than others have, certainly than Tillerson has, um, despite a, a deep um, mistrust of, of, of the UN on the part of, of the Trump White House, and in many respects, in many parts of the Republican Party. I, I, well, I, I, I thought she was doing okay, kind of navigating a difficult situation, and then when the, uh, the Jerusalem thing came up, and she basically came out and said, you know, we're going to be taking names of everybody who yeah. doesn't support us on this, and we're going to be like cutting your aid and doing bad things to you. That was real Trumpian. Yeah, it and it was very disappointing because, you know, we do use the UN and we use foreign aid in these ways, but the less you do this in an overt sense, the kind of, you know, the better it is and the better it works because once you kind of rub people's noses in it, right, they become even more resistant to doing the things that you want and, you know, if you do it in public and stuff. I, I also saw that um, McMaster's maybe on his way out. And one of the names that they keep mentioning is John Bolton, who, who was a Bush era uh, ambassador to the UN and, and a, a huge, colossal UN hater. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, well, they've talked about Kelly being on his way out, McMaster being on his way out, Tillerson on his way out. I mean, it's, it's you know, with Trump, I think you're on your way out, unless you're still in. Um, the, the, the good news, of course, is that John Bolton has this ridiculous mustache, and apparently that really turned Trump off when he was interviewing him for a State Department job. But, you know. One more question? Um, the immigration question is, is you, you know, a tough one. Um, I think that most of the advanced industrial countries need immigration because they're not sort of reproducing themselves uh, naturally and unless they want to see their populations decline, immigration is going to be the way to, to, to help with that problem. Um, uh, and especially with building sort of a younger sort of cohort uh, uh, of, of working, you know, workers uh, in, the, in the economy. Um, so I think that that's an, a, an important sort of asset to any economy. Um, and we've looked at, started looking at, you know, is it really communities that have been overrun with immigrants that are the ones who voted Trump? And it's not. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the center of the United States is not overrun with immigrants. If it, it, the concentrations of immigrants tend to be on the coasts. Um, there's, it's more variegated now in some ways, but it's certainly not in these areas that are just completely red in the center of the United States. So it doesn't seem as if that is really the pressing issue, that it's like the immigrant that moves in next door to you or the immigrant family that's the, that's the issue. It's got to be something about people feeling that this is, I think, you know, like it's no longer my country. But, but that is as much about immigrants it is, as it is about gay marriage or abortion or legalization of marijuana, I think, than it is about sort of immigrants. It's feeling like the values that the government is, you know, supporting are not the values that I have somehow. The values that the president incarnates, those values. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. right. Yes, 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 yes. As an, uh, he's an evangelical Christian, isn't he? Uh, yeah. he? <laughs> uh, no comment. Um, so. Okay, well, thank you very much. I, I certainly enjoyed the conversation.